Well, hello. Good afternoon. Mm -hmm. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Good. My name is Dr. Lanisa Kitchener, and I serve as head of education and scholarly initiatives here at the National Museum of African Art, Smithsonian Institution. It is my great, great, great pleasure to welcome you to round two of today's cultural round table. Uh, the first part this morning was a really, really, really exciting uh, interactive dialogue uh, that I think resonated in ways that I couldn't even possibly have imagined when the spearhead of this project, my colleague Nicole Shivers, brought it to the fore in terms of a concept. She said, you know, Lanisa, the idea is to get people talking <laughs> about what unites us, what makes us distinct. And so this second part of this cultural roundtable is a continuation of the first, which addressed the whole notion of Africanisms in Oman, Omaniisms in East Africa and Kenya more particularly. The first panel talked about the political imperatives and realities that shape individual connectedness uh, and the ways in which people are engaging on a person-to-person -person level. This panel is made up of a wonderful and diverse group of individuals, scholars, artists, and I'll just start on my right and go around. We'll have a very informal conversation, just as we did the first, I th with the first round table. This one will be a bit distinct, however, and that it will be followed by a Q&A session. So listen up and chime in when it's uh, <coughs> open, uh, open to the floor. So I'll just start on my far right here with Alison Purpura. And she's coming to us from Illinois Urbana Champaign, where she is curator of the Craner Art Museum. Adjacent to her, we have Anna Molago, who's a triple threat and who's <laughs> uber popular and whom I bumped into the other day and she said, do I know you? <laughs> and I said, no, 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 but I have your CD, I have your fan, I know you, you're awesome. And she said, oh, okay. And then I tried to sing as she does, but she's got a special gift. Oh, well, thank you. So this is our Anna Mualago. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then we have a very dear friend of mine who comes to us from Howard University, Dr. Suleiman Yang. Dr. Suleiman Yang, as many of you may know, is really what I would consider <laughs> among the deans of Islamic studies, particularly as it relates to African experiences. And then we have Muzna. Muzna, who comes to us, who comes to us all the way from overseas and who just got in to show us her film, Cholo, which will, I think, be the discussion that she brings to the table, one of a film director, a screenwriter, and an actress in her own right. Welcome, Musa. And then at the opposite end here, we have Nathaniel, who's, I think, in candidacy. Mm -hmm. Am I right? Mm -hmm. So he's a doctoral candidate working on the subject matter. I'm going to stop there because these folks are engaged in the field in exciting ways that you know you want to hear about, and so do I. So shall we start first with Allison, who has lots of work going on and is able to just get us going. Well, thank you so much, Letitia, and of course, thank you so much to Nicole Shivers and to the National Museum of African Art for inviting me to participate in this really quite wonderful uh, roundtable on uh, Oman, uh, the Swahili coast, and the Western Indian Ocean world. So I guess following the, um, the, the, the uh, format of uh, our last um, very awesome panel, um, I can begin by saying that, yes, my name is Alison Purpura, and I'm a curator of African art at the Credit Art Museum at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And, you know, I was thinking when I saw the title of this panel, um, the connecting the gems of the Indian Ocean, ways of knowing. And I thought about ways of knowing in a particularly intimate way for me because my doctoral work was on uh, the social construction of Islamic knowledge in Zanzibar. And though I am now, I kind of see myself as at the interstices uh, uh, between art history and anthropology because my degree was in anthropology, but um, even though I'm working and have been working with the visual and expressive arts now for over a decade, I, I find that um, 
you know, being a, a mongrel of sorts in the in this interdisciplinary gray range has been has been a um, a, a great uh, 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 well, it's been a very curious experience, and it's, I think it's been really great in some ways. But to get back to this ways of knowing, I think one of the things that's really important to always be thinking about, particularly in terms of what we learned to this afternoon, um, uh, this morning on the panel, is that um, uh, there are multiple discourses, multiple identities, and confluences, of course, between the Arabian Peninsula and, and the East African coast and the greater Indian Ocean world. And um, one of the um, uh, things that was important to me when I was doing my research um, on, in Zanzibar was looking at how ways of knowing, particularly in terms of Islamic knowledge and healing and other kinds of social practices that were informed by by, by um, uh, performances of piety and Islamic knowledge is that these are, are forms of knowledge that can't necessarily be separated out as Omani or Zanzibari or Swahili per se. Um, it is true that certain forms of knowledge such as astrology and, um, and, and, and um, Quranic reading <coughs> and particularly, particular forms of uh, divination um, and magical squares and something called the spreading of the letters. These are all knowledge systems that were very much informed by, by um, Omani immigrants to the coast. But the way in which they've, they've for come together um, and have informed questions of, of illness and healing uh, is something that is, um, there's a certain aesthetics to that which also cannot be teased out in terms of a particular kind of um, or you know, segregated identity. So um, just to, to conclude these few <coughs> moments of, of thought here, I wanted to um, share with you that, that my colleague, the awesome Preeta Meyer, and I are <coughs> organizing at the uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign an exhibition which is actually the first of its kind on the Swahili coast and the Western Indian Ocean world and the ways in which the Swahili coast is really this interstitial space as Preeta described earlier that, that extends up into the uh, upcountry uh, uh, Africa and well across the Indian Ocean um, um, beyond even um, the Arabian Peninsula and so this exhibition will be exploring the way in which objects can instantiate and express that fluidity, that complexity of, of, connect, of connection and locatedness, the kinds of tensions that emerge from both a cosmopolitan ethos of understanding difference and nevertheless a rootedness and connectedness to, to where one um, um, you know, defines their affinities. So um, that is an exhibition that I hope we can talk a little bit more about too in the way in which the arts, the visual arts are implicated in telling these kinds of stories of, con of confluence but also of ongoing and very uh, lively tensions uh, within the region. Thank you, thank you, Alice. And you know, it's interesting that you're opening with ways of knowing and closing with the ways in which art represent the various ways in which we know. <laughs> it's a natural segue, I think, into Anna Mualago, who represents not only ways of knowing, but ways of doing, and ways of being in the world, which I think was part and parcel of the, the, the first panel, uh, the, the, the first uh, conversation today, where we talked about food and mm. architecture and music and how it really is a representation of our different ways of being mm. and belonging mm -hmm. in the world. So Anna, if you would please tell us about yes. you and your world of artistry. Uh, thank you uh, for having this, uh, giving me this opportunity, and I just want to say thank you also to the Smithsonian and Nicole for all the work she has been doing. Uh, my name is Anna Mwalago, I'm from uh, Kenya, and um, I am an artist here in the United States. I am a singer, songwriter, poet, storyteller, comedian, a um, lot of things into one. And I also have a band that we, with my musical band, we do music from East Africa, West Africa, and South Africa, a little bit from the North. Um, also, what I wanted to share with you today, given this opportunity, I'm blessed to have lived in two places when I was growing up, meaning Mombasa and Nairobi. So living in uh, Mombasa gave me the experience of uh, being uh, in an area whereby we had both cultures of the mainland and the coastal people. So I have more experience in terms of the music, what I used to hear, what I play right now, that really um, symbolizes 
what I learned as a child living in Mombasa, mm -hmm. and at the same time also um, the culture, our culture in the coast is very respectful, respectable. Uh, we honor our elders just like an, in the mainland. Um, we try to do everything in, in form of a village or a community. Uh, and I would love to share this with you. At the same time, the food is excellent. And um, I know more people talked about that. And also I will share that with you because I had the experience, even though I am Christian, living in Mombasa is m many of the people of Mombasa are Muslims but who are able to relate with each other, share in the same uh, holidays they have and the ones we have in terms of the food, uh, the music, and just um, cultural-wise. So I'll be sharing that with you today, and I just want to say thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. So, Dr. Nguyen, we're just going to skip yeah. over to you and go with the yeah. other lady. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Muzna Musafir from Oman. Um, I'm a filmmaker. <coughs> I'm a filmmaker, and uh, actually, I write and I direct and I, I act. Uh, um, I thought about this film when I was uh, living in Sweden, and as I lived abroad for seven years, uh, out of Muscat and out of Oman. Uh, when I came back, I decided to write something about this country because of its uh, unique beauty and also because Oman was smarter than the other Gulf countries to reserve that beauty and to, to, to keep um, something of, of its own um, thing, you know. So um, I wrote a story called uh, Cholo, and I was very happy that something I thought about, uh, it changed into a, a film and a vision that others believed in. And I got a fund for it, and uh, it won a prize uh, in Abu Dhabi Film Festival. About two little boys, uh, uh, one from Oman, one from Zanzibar, Abdullah and Cholo, Nasser. <coughs> uh, because of their father, he, he decides to go back to Oman and, and live there. And he comes back with, uh, after he got married with another wife, and he comes back with Abdullah to the island. And then the grandmother um, is surprised to see Abdullah for the first time. And they, leave, they live a unique um, adventure and, and something of, um, of I always uh, thought that Zanzibar is, is, is about fantasy and about magic and about uh, lions and about Simbas. So this film is my imagination. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, okay. Later, you? <coughs> Assalamu alaikum everybody, and uh, Hamjambo. Hamjambo, you're supposed to say Hatujambo. Hamjambo. Hatujambo. Excellent, excellent. I'm so pleased to be here, and thank all of you for coming. I'm very pleased as well that I can say the last time I s I've seen a great number of you was either in Oman or in Zanzibar, so you know you have the right people in the room when that's, that's the case. Um, I'm a PhD candidate at Northwestern University, my research, uh, which you'll probably have to drag me with a cane from talking about, is dangerous to ask PhD candidates about their research uh, and give them a microphone at the same time. Uh, it's about uh, the Omani Zanzibari community. In particular, I'm doing uh, oral history and archival history with uh, people who left after the 1964 revolution from Zanzibar. And, um, they sort of scattered to many different places. Uh, in 1970, many of them returned to Oman at the invitation of the Sultan, the new Sultan Qaboos, and played an instrumental role in rebuilding the country. So my research is about historical memory, how these people remember Zanzibar, how they think about it, um, how many of them uh, revisit it, uh, as we saw in um, Musna's lovely film last night, uh, and the way in which multiple generations of Zanzibar, of Omani, excuse me, are engaged with Zanzibar. And so uh, that's my research. And one of the things that I don't know, I'm making some assumptions about our audience, um, but one of the things that I've found when talking about this with groups is that we often think in terms of binaries between African and Arab. And this is a theme that came up in the previous uh, the previous panel. And some of us have in our minds what we think a typical Arab should look like. 
and we have this idea that's very deeply shaped by sort of Western racial and ethnic categories. And I think Oman actually offers a, 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 an interesting instance for us to reframe what the, those terms actually mean and to expand what those terms mean, both the term African and the term Arab. Um, and yeah. Excellent. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm Suleiman Yang at Howard University. I'm very delighted to be invited by friends here. I'm not a stranger to the Smithsonian because I was involved with the Museum of Natural History when we were looking at Africa, Africa Hall. I was the lead developer for the Smithsonian at that time. And of course, if you go to the museum there, you will see what we did then. And I'm happy to be here to, and I thank the people who organized this one. I just give you five points because of time so that you can begin to understand the significance of this meeting here. First of all, Oman is unique among the Middle Eastern countries, not only in terms of the political geography of Oman, historically, going back to the Greeks, right to modern times, the isolation of that place and the manner in which it affected Greek geographers. And as you travel as geographers, you give names to places. When they came to the Red Sea, you have Eritrea, which is now a political entity coming from the Greeks. And you go all the way up to Oman, you see when the Greeks over that area. And of course you have the Indians, you can see Alexander the Great and all those people coming over into that region. And you can see the impact they have on the region. The Americans are now in Afghanistan. Alexander the Great came that way. If you come to Oman, Oman is very important for American strategy right now because the American military and the American military resources need Oman. Oman is a safe place and is very close to Iran. That's why Oman becomes a very important place. If you're looking at Islam, the division among the Muslims is very clear in Oman because you can see that the Shiites and the Sunni division you find right now in the Middle East is in Oman. But the Omanis are very different. If you're a Westerner, you want to understand the history of the Crusades, and you want to understand what happened to Christianity, you can see Switzerland. Oman is the Switzerland of the Arab world. Switzerland is very different, because if you go to Switzerland, you have French, Germans, Italians, one country, and they have a religion separate from the Catholics and the other Protestants. That's Oman for you. They have the Ibadi religion. The third point that you have to take away, if you are from Zanzibar, and you are from Southern Africa, and you can see the impact of imperialism in world history, and how imperialism affects all the conversation about food, how foreign cultures change your food habit. If you want to understand what happened to the Arabs, travel from Morocco, going to the Gulf, you see couscous in North Africa. Mm -hmm. You come to Libya and Egypt, the demarcation line, all the anthropologists and sociologists will see when you cross Libya into Egypt, you're moving from the spaghetti territory because of the Italians to bread and rice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you are looking at history, the third point I want to raise for you in this question here is that if you are looking at Oman and you want to understand the, how the Oman is affected, this is the whole question of race, ethnicity, and who are you? Who is an Arab? Even the Arabs themselves could not define who is an Arab. It was an Englishman called A.J. Argib who came with a definition of Arab. Anyone who speaks the Arabic language, take part in Arab history, and identify with the history of the Arabs from being barbarians to being leaders of civilization. And that's what happened. The Arabs accepted who is an Arab. <laughs> so all of the people, regardless of who they are, they are Arab. The last point I will ask you with, to think about it. If you look at Oman and King Habus, and you are African, you can see Swaziland and Oman are parallels mm -hmm. in terms of political theory. In Oman, they have a king who exercises royal control. In a way, most of the liberals here would say they don't have human rights, they don't have civil rights. 
You have a doubt about that? Go to Swaziland, the same narrative. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. They said, well, I think this leads us right back to you then. Oh. And the reason being is because what we are talking about now is different histories of identity mm -hmm. in an area that you are <coughs> studying. So help us to better understand these multiple identities, multiple histories, contested identities, contested histories. I think I can do no better than to raise up the name of uh, the late, great Professor Ali Mazrui, mm -hmm. uh, who's, I, I'm, uh, we should have raised his name earlier, but uh, mm -hmm. he, he passed on recently. And um, he developed a theory to understand the identity uh, and the impact of different uh, historical changes on Africa. And that was the theory of, of the triple heritage, the sort of, um, as he saw it, the legacy of uh, indigenous belief systems, number one. Number two, the legacy of Islam in Africa. And number three, the legacy of European colonialism. Um, and he called this the triple heritage. And ironically enough, Ali Mazrui himself was a product of the Swahili culture. <laughs> His father was the chief Qadi of Kenya, of, uh, and he himself was born in Mombasa. Mm -hmm. um, and he is part of a family, the Mazrui family traces their roots back to oh, wow. Oman. Uh, they came to, uh, uh, to the east coast of Africa in the 18th century, and maybe even earlier, somebody can correct me on this, um, so they have a long history in East Africa, and if you go to Oman today, you will meet people who are Mazrui. Um, so he was a political scientist, and I have to believe that he was grappling with some of these issues, and, and that this whole theory of his, and many of his political theories, came out of his personal experience of being raised in a Swahili family, a very elite Swahili family, and then he actually went abroad, I believe, to Oxford to to study. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I think it provides us maybe an entryway into the, into the topic. I think so. I think so. Allison, what would you add there? Well, yes, I think a triple heritage is um, a, a, a broad way of, well, I would call it a point of departure, really, because it's, it was maybe um, a significant observation at the time and is now almost a truism. And I think one of the things that so much of the scholarship since that time has begun to unpack are really, truly the complexities of, of sort of, you know, how do you excavate the layers? How, how, do, they, how do they interact? How do they um, really impinge on questions, uh, you know, that you're talking about these contested identities that have been discussed so much in the earlier panel about, um, you know, the ways in which Omani colonization, British colonization, shape and reify, fix in place what is otherwise very fluid categories of identity. Those fluid categories also, I mean, this is just, well, the Swahili world in general and the whole Western Indian Ocean littoral in general is a very fluid social world that is also one of great hierarchy. So how people move in and out of and negotiate those statuses, how one negotiates being manumitted or freed after being a slave, how one um, um, negotiates um, having a settled claim to a place, right, even though one is a kind of, if you will, diasporic native, uh, to use Nseng Ho's term. These are people who are constantly moving back and forth. Even when they're settled for many, 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 many years, their affinities may still be up country as well as across, across the, the, uh, the Indian Ocean, uh, uh, beyond the horizon. So um, I think what's really important is to understand that those kinds of negotiations often have as much to do with, with aspects that, that touch all three of those things, such as dissent. There's a real paradox of dissent when it comes to identity politics on the Swahili coast because as um, one of our panelists this morning pointed out, being the most, if you will, authentic or original Zanzibari meant claiming foreign heritage to being Shirazi. 
right? So these kinds of complexities, I think, are a little are are really where we need to go beyond that triple heritage to really begin to excavate how it is that um, identity discourses become how where where they percolate up from, and then which are really the broader material conditions of social life, right? And then how ultimately they get expressed, which is where I think aesthetic and artistic production also becomes really, really important because those are tools in the hands of people who are constantly negotiating and refashioning themselves in a very fluid and complex social world, right, of, of statuses. If I may say something, yeah. um, I've had a burning issue and I, I brought it up when we were having lunch with my, two of my friends who were in the first panel. And I just uh, like shared out there with Nathaniel, Professor, and so that you can help us who really uh, need to understand the history in aspect of slavery and trade to, to show the connection between the Oman and the people of the East Coast of Africa. What I was sharing with them earlier is that really that people of East Africa really we did not speak openly about slavery. To us, we know that slavery never happened in East Africa. We know we feel like it was something from the West that happened in the West Africa whereby our, our African ancestors were enslaved. So when they were speaking earlier to do with the coastal people and in the coast, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the coastal area and in the mainland or in the inland, how they relate to each other and somebody brought up the concept of enslaved African in the coastal area, in the, in the east coast of Africa, I pointed out and said, you know what, this, I had never heard of this before because what I had was that slavery really, there was really a small, slavery never happened as much in East Africa than in West Africa. And when it did happen, it was only in the coastal area, not in the inland or the mainland because at that time the Arabs who were practicing slavery, that is maybe before the 19th century, were not able to go to the mainland or in, in the inland lands of the cities or the villages because maybe of the forest and all that stuff. So I would like for us to discuss, maybe you can help me the, uh, and many others out there who have this kind of questions, just to explain further the relationship in terms of the trade. I know they exchange cloves and, um, and with cowrie shells and all that as form of what you call the barter trade but at the same time about the, in, the enslaved Africans. Yeah, okay, I think, <laughs> yeah, I, I think, no, you know, when we had the first panel, you see, I listened attentively to details. The problem we have as human beings, we have memories, but memories can be long or short. Most of us are not elephants, we have short memories. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, People rewrite their history. You have the rewriting of history. Mm. If you talk to black people in Africa about slavery, the only slavery they remember is the slavery where Europeans were slavers, but then they became abolitionists. Mm -hmm. The Arabs never acknowledged slavery and did what the Europeans did. Europeans, they have abolitionist movement, and that's part of the history. So when you talk about the, if you're African American, you talk about the Middle Passage. Mm -hmm. That's the narrative, that's the metaphor. You talk about the Middle Passage 500 years ago, and of course Columbus is the bad guy. Since Columbus, 500 years ago, I have been in many conferences in the United States here with the Council of World National Religions debating Columbus, we discuss it, Latin American. You have, uh, you have Indians, you have African American scholars, you have Jews, we all look at Columbus and the impact it has on these minorities in American society and in the world. If you go to the Indian Ocean, slavery took place, but it's not remembered by the East Africans. <laughs> because for them, you have double denial. The Arabs deny it, the Africans deny it. In West Africa, most West Africans, they don't accept that slavery happened there. You go to Ghana, they have the castle there. Most Ghanaians are not going to tell you whether uh, some of our ancestors were slaves. Mm -hmm. Alex Haley's Kunta Kinte story. Mm -hmm. We came from the Gambia. The Gambians didn't recognize that. Okay. It was Alex Haley who came with the Gambian who was a student here. I know the whole story about Alex Haley myself. When I was a graduate, an undergraduate student uh, at Hampton University. When I was a student at Hampton University, 
before a Jewish professor exposed me to the Alex Haley story. Alex Haley was talking, by the way, to the American Psychological Association. That's how the beginning of what most Americans now talk about, the Kunta Kinte story. And then, of course, Alex Haley told the story, and the rest is now history. But I want to prepare for him to come as a graduate student to step in. Number one, it's quite correct that he raised Ali Mazrui. Mm -hmm. Without any pat on the back. I was the first scholar who wrote about Ali Mazrui before Ali Mazrui became famous. <laughs> <laughs> and you see, at the African Studies Association meeting in Philadelphia in 1980, is now history. Mm -hmm. 34 years later, mm -hmm. he became famous, known to the American with the Africans. And I think the young graduate student can run with the ball and go ahead and do it. I would just raise, uh, uh, to piggyback off of what you said, Professor, there's a great book on the subject, and I'll try to summarize briefly what it's about. It's actually a novel. Um, uh, for those of you who are here in the morning panel, I thought, Preeta, you did an, uh, an amazing job at summarizing the changes in slavery in the 19th century. And the 19th century is really the key for understanding um, how people think about the history of slavery in East Africa. Uh, uh, because that is when the most intense penetration of the, of the mainland happened and of the interior, and the most intense uh, uh, slave trading. And ironically, a lot of the plantation slavery in the 19th century on the east coast of Africa was a result of British policies of abolition. Now that sounds paradoxical, but the British ban the trade in slaves. So what happens is that they haven't actually banned and interfered in slavery itself because many of these places are still semi-sovereign territories. Mm -hmm. um, and so a thriving plantation slavery system actually grows up on the east coast of Africa as a result of British policies of abolition, just to show you how sometimes policies have unintended consequences. But to return to this novel, the novel's name is Paradise, and it's by Abdul Razak Gurna, and he's actually a Zanzibari, he now teaches at University of Kent. And the book is about a young boy who is pawned now this, is, this was quite a common practice in the 19th century during times of famine. You might pawn somebody to say, okay, give me food and give me money so we can survive, and I'm loaning you this person mm -hmm. so that he can serve you for a set amount of time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, that was a common practice. Yeah. What happens in the 19th century is that the, the sort of contract, the unwritten contract, breaks down. Okay, so people don't have money necessarily to get their son or their daughter back, yeah. mm -hmm. or yeah. people are so greedy for money and, uh, and commodities that they don't give the daughter or son back, uh, or they end up actually just stealing people, that this thing spirals out of control. And so what this novel is about is this boy who's pawned, he's then sold to the coast, he becomes the slave of a wealthy merchant on the coast, um, and this is actually just at the turn of the century. And he is in this household, this very rich household of this merchant. He becomes close to the merchant. He then goes back up country with the merchant on ivory hunts. And so you see some of the processes by which the coast and the, the interior sort of got uh, integrated together into the world economic system in the 19th century. And at the end of the novel, he's faced with this choice do I stay with my master, where he, there's this very odd dynamic, but at least this is a life I know, or do I run away uh, and join the sort of colonial forces? And he actually makes a decision in the end to run away, and it's almost like from one frying pan into mm -hmm. another, although the author doesn't spell it out for you, he's going to join these, these, uh, these colonial forces, which you serve under extremely brutal mm -hmm. and even slave-like <coughs> conditions. Mm -hmm. So to just give you a sense of how hard life was in parts mm -hmm. of East Africa in the 19th century, and people had to make these hard choices, um, and you can see some of the complexities of, uh, of things that people were wrestling with. So I think, ironically enough, 
one of the best treatments of slavery in East Africa is a novel. It's not uh, a history. I, I, I'd like to chime in there, though, because I think there's an interesting point that Gurnau picks up in, in, in Paradise, and that is this idea of family. Because in the text, you'll recall that the young boy initially identifies with the person that becomes his master as uncle. Mm. As uncle. And so this idea of at least slavery in this particular part of the world is part and parcel of a bigger conversation of how individuals are connecting with one another. Mm -hmm. Right? And so this concept of family, this idea of an uncle who then later becomes this sort of uh, master figure mm -hmm. in this young man's world. Mm -hmm. And maybe we could expound upon that a little sure. bit. Can, can we talk about that, Anna? Uh, yes. I would okay. like to uh, speak about that because I really like what Nathaniel the professor said, that at that time, which I'll bring it to the modern world in East Africa, yes. because at that yes. time, yes. the issue of pawning, <laughs> as you explained, yes, is, yes. is what goes on right now in East Africa. But we don't call it pawning as or slavery, as they used to call it then. Because, for example, I'll give you an a very good idea like in Kenya whereby you have what you call the interior parts of Kenya and then the main city which is Nairobi you find that people who live in um, the interior parts of Kenya maybe in the rural area where there is no proper electricity or it's not urban it's rural there is a lot of rural to urban migration so what happens between families they could be distant relatives they could be people who just come originally their ancestors come from the same village but because like now my family we have land and we live in the urban area and i still go back and forth to the village i meet one of the person who's either my distant relative in the village and he or she tells me i have a daughter and because of a lack of uh, finances i have not been able to educate my daughter to high school or college and therefore i need my daughter to go to the urban area to find look for work and could you please take my daughter and she will help you with housework she will clean she will cook she will do all this while you find a way of educating her in either some form of work so that she can become independent so this is something that is done nowadays too but we never call it slavery we never call it pawning and that was i believe the history of even when the girl comes to the urban area, she will refer to my mother as auntie, I will refer to her as cousin, we will live together, we will eat together, we will do everything together, and at the same time, my mom or my parents will try to educate her, and I will know her as my relative. I will not say that this is a maid, I will say, oh, that's my cousin. So this is, this is what goes on, but in a way whereby we are helping each other, if I may say, more than saying it is servitude, or slavery. Yes, some people use it negatively sometimes and sometimes it's not as it is agreed to be in the beginning, but this is something that goes on and so I just, I'm so happy that you gave me the opportunity to say this mm -hmm. and to explain it that really even in those days, some families maybe in the 19th century were not doing it out of slavery. I'm not selling somebody. I'm giving you somebody to help you as a result of you helping me with something and I hope she will return or he will return not knowing that that person will be subjugated to a lot of, a lot of hard work. I think there's an interesting point here that picks up on your film, Musna, because this idea of family is a critical theme in, in the narrative that you're presenting. So what might you contribute to this idea mm -hmm. of, of human movement and family and the role that the two are playing in the broader history of Oman and uh, well, uh, I think in um, in the film I'm presenting a family, uh, like which is uh, originally Omani, but they live in Zanzibar, um, and one immigrates and um, uh, goes back to Oman. He carries an Omani passport, but because there are no opportunities in in Zanzibar uh, anymore for Omanis uh, because of the uh, sort of segregation from the Tanzanian government. Mm -hmm. Uh, that they are trying to mix people from the mainland to Zanzibar and trying to push uh, the Omani Arabs aside so they don't have job opportunities, etc. So uh, I think um, this family is, is very different and unique, just like many families uh, mm -hmm. 
who had uh, like history and roots in, in Zanzibar and they try to uh, to come back to Oman I mean the the father uh, and you know it's also the, the, the story about the identity because uh, many Omanis who who like sorry many Zanzibari Omanis who came recently they just don't speak Arabic and they have a different uh, identity mm -hmm. so it's hard for them to catch up with with the with the culture of Muscat, the capital city, or the Omani culture. Okay. I see. So yeah. it, this is, it's, it's really fascinating that Nathaniel would turn to a novel. Mm -hmm. Because as we know, a novel is really a sort of imagination, a reimagination mm -hmm. of a historical event, in this case when we're talking about uh, uh, Gurnaz Paradise. But what stands out to me really is this need to define an identity. Mm. It's almost as if we're saying, well, will the real Zanzibari please stand up, <laughs> right? Or, you know, something along those lines. Yeah. And I'm sort of grappling with that because yeah. in the United States, you know, we had the one drop rule. Yes. And there was an absolute definition. If you no, had no. one drop, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, you're no, black, right? Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, in Germany, it was if you had your father's blood Again. and he was a German, then you were German. Mm -hmm. And as I go along the Swahili coast, <laughs> as you all are carrying me there through your various different narratives, mm -hmm. I'm wondering where to find this identity we're looking for. And in this post-slavery, post-colonial, post-post-post-post-post moment, mm -hmm. is there even such a yeah. thing, or is it all fluid? You see, the whole question of identity is just a problem for human beings. <laughs> People, we are victims of three concepts. One is history, which is always contested. I remember in graduate school, one of my Italian professors at UVA used to say, it is victors. Those who are the victors, they define what is history. I remember, I will never forget that professor when she said that, which is true. History is one. When people win wars, they rewrite history to suit their interests. Then unfortunately for human beings, we are also capable of myth-making, mythology. You create mythology. Mythology, you can even rewrite history to put yourself in a leading star role when you are not leading star. <laughs> you are just part of the extras, mm -hmm. <laughs> you see. But that is mythology. And then human beings have to deal with metaphysics. And this is where we come to the whole question of life and death. Mm -hmm. We don't know where we're going. Mm -hmm. If you're a Jew, Christian, and Muslims, you believe that you have a one-way ticket here. You're not coming back. Mm -hmm. If you're a Yoruba or a Wolof, from Africa, and there are many Africans like that, or you are a Hindu, or a Jain, or a Buddhist, you believe that you have a multiple entry visa back to the world. <laughs> Reincarnation. So these are the different ways we deal with identity. Mm -hmm. If you are a Jew, Christian, Muslim, we are going to be resurrected in the next life. You see me in the grave here, I'll be back. <laughs> and of course, the secularists, they don't believe that. <laughs> you see, so the identity stops here. Mm -hmm. You see, so when you deal with identity, it's all created by human beings. Let, let me be direct with most of us who are Americans here, you live in America. In the first revolution of the United States, 93% of the Americans were English. They were not British, they were English. 93% of the Americans were English. Today, most of us, I'm from Zambia, I'm from America today. There's some Jamaicans. There are some Italians, there are some Germans, there are all, they're all Americans. They're Vietnamese, they're all Americans today. Mm -hmm. Who is an American? The only way you can see any human being who carries an American passport and is accepted by all the Americans who are doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. You're an American. Then you solve the problem of who are you. Of course, we can qualify it. They used to do that in America here. You have to speak English. That's why the Americans, when they broke away, we have some of the intellectuals like Samuel Webster. You have American English. We separate our English from the other English from England. That's how you mark your identity. So we have American English. It's not English English. And you can tell the difference. 
Who are the closest to the us? The Canadians. They are English speaking people too. But they are not calling themselves Americans. Isn't that true? They have a Canadian <laughs> identity. <laughs> that is the whole question of identity. Who defines who you are, what you are? Mm -hmm. It all depends on your politics, mm -hmm. your theology, mm -hmm. and your psychology. You come to the Arabs. If you know the new history of Islam and you know the Arabs, who are the Arabs today? Most of the Palestinians, they are the children of the Crusaders who came to fight for the Crusades. If you have any doubt about that, look at their complexion. Many of them, they look Europeans. But they are Arabs. Go to Saudi Arabia. Go to Oman. Compare the differences. These are very touchy issues. People, when it comes to identity, you're dealing with very dangerous powder cake. Because it all depends on how you define yourself. And how do you go about defining yourself. These are very dangerous issues. So when you talk about identity, you have to be very careful as to what you're talking about identity. That's why if you go to Zanzibar, those Zanzibarians who are speaking Swahili, mm -hmm. their Arabic is not good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just finalized this point. The problem between Professor Masrui and Henry Louis Gate and Wale Soyinka mm -hmm. came up on this issue. She can prove that, mm -hmm. she's from that area. When Wale Soyinka was defending Henry Gates at Harvard, because he did a video called The Wonders of Africa. Mm -hmm. Ali Masri has the Africans. Mm -hmm. Two contrasting narratives. Mm -hmm. When the African-American went to Zanzibar and he met some Zanzibarian, mm -hmm. he asked one of them, who are you? Mm -hmm. Some of the panelists already made reference to that. Mm -hmm. I'm Afro Sirasi. Who mm -hmm. look like my cousin. <laughs> He's an African-American giving him an identity. Mm -hmm. You see, he's an African-American. He's out there. He is a person who was raised by the parents that you are of Iranian descent. Mm -hmm. You are afro syrian mm -hmm. She's from there. She can conform to what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. You see, that is how you define who you are. So you see, when Masri, he was advising, the less Ali Masri was advising, he was a, he was a very respected scholar. This African American had Harvard, Henry Gates asked him to be an advisor. But when he went and came back with that narrative, have class. <laughs> there you have it. There you have it. I think if we could just maybe do a quick round of closing remarks before we open it up to all of you for a few questions, if we may. Shall we start with you, Allison? Oh, sure, sure. Well, um, again, thank you for, for uh, this fantastic round table. And I, um, I'm just thinking. Uh, Ah, it's just so impossible to, we're really just opening, of course, the discussion, as many have said on this question of the politics of identity, but I just wanted to add as we, as we think in that direction that it's really also about identity becomes something when the politics of difference are now, if not accounted for or are not understood in terms of imbalances of power, in terms of um, um, questions of inequality, so that identity begins to matter, begins to be something that has to be negotiated, has to be something that's asserted and performed in contexts often that have to do with um, um, exclusions and um, issues of, of um, uh, subordination. So I think we need to keep thinking about what the contexts are that produce difference and the politics of the production of difference when we begin to try and think about what identity really is. Because identity cannot exist and does not exist in a social or political vacuum, as we certainly know. Right? So it's the reception and perception of difference, which of course is something that, that um, I think, if nothing else, the Swahili Coast in the Western Indian Ocean world, um, indeed there are tensions, but there's a certain ease or comfort with being able to, to move between and consider those kinds of differences. I'm just thinking, actually in your film, I know many of you did not see the film last night, but you actually raised the issue of an observation of um, the father saying of this young boy, he, he's, he, looks, he looks very fine, he's, very, he's lighter mm -hmm. than this boy who is darker. So you have implicit also in your own narrative these issues of recognition, 
of difference and what those differences mean in particular sorts of contexts. Why that, um, you know, uh, those, those kinds of um, um, distinctions continue to be made and, and become part of that, part of that broader um, experience of, of, of othering that continues to go on. So I thought it was really interesting and very sensitively dealt with in your film when that thanks. came up. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you. Thanks. Oh, uh, yeah, please. Okay, um, I just wanted to say something a little bit on the identity and then I can speak uh, more about the cultural aspect of our food, music, and dance. Uh, so when we, when we talk about identity, it was funny because I, uh, I was born in Nairobi, but I grew up in uh, Mombasa. Oh, and uh, not only that, I also, my ancestor or my ethnic group is Taita, which is mm -hmm. from the coast. Mm -hmm. So I am one of those people who a lot of people mistake my identity as a Kenyan and they will say, oh, oh you when you are Mombasa, meaning you are from Mombasa, just because I am from the coast, and people from the coast are known to speak very fluent Swahili more than people who live in the interior or in the in the in the other parts of the of Kenya. So with that aspect, because I speak good Swahili, and because the people of Mombasa are also known as Waswahili, but at the same time as that being their ethnic uh, language or their tribe, but at the same time the people who live in Mombasa. Some of them don't want to be known as Waswahili. They want to be known as Mijikenda mm -hmm. because they are the nine tribes of the villages of, of Mombasa. So there is a lot of identity crisis. And some of them don't want to be known as Waswahili, but they also want to be known by, as Islam because so now there is a relationship between the religion and the ethnic culture. So I think when it comes to identity, we can stay here for hours yeah. because everybody will tell you, no, I'm not this, I'm that, I'm this or I'm that. So it's a very complex issue and hopefully we can be able to discuss it further in the later, uh, in the future. I'll talk a little bit just to mention how I believe the Oman and the East Coast of Africa uh, relate in terms of the food and uh, the music and the dances. I can say when it comes to the food, most of the food from the po people of East Africa had an influence of the spices that came from uh, the Omani. So like the food from the coast of Mombasa and Zanzibar is spicy, is sometimes also sweet. And I think it's the relationship. So it's the relationship of they had during the trade routes where they exchange spices and all that. And so you can even find that this example of pilau or kaimati, you can find that this, like kaimati is like, what can you say, dumplings or mandazi, almost donuts. You can find that also now the people in the rural area or people in the interior of Kenya also cook the same foods. So at the same time, this, uh, this relationship or this cultural aspect has spread all over east coast of Africa. When it comes to the music, uh, my band and I had a opportunity to perform uh, this summer here at the Smithsonian for three deep three shows and uh, we sang music called Ta'arab. Ta'arab I think is, means is a Arabic word meaning smooth or beautiful music, smooth music and the Ta'arab in itself is a mixture of Arabic music and the coast of East Africa and it's kind of like almost blues, it's sweet, it's sensual and um, most of the time in the music, we talk about, we, we explain stories, we try to uh, share what is going on in the community, we try to profess our love, and part of the music also talks about the belief in God. So you find that music like Tara, whereby it was shared with the people of Oman, and at the same time people of the East Coast of Africa, was something that united the people because they had People have similar, um, uh, what can you say, issues. So when it comes to love, when it comes to um, God, when it comes to um, things in the family, and one famous lady from Zanzibar who was known as Queen of Tara, Biki Dude, was well, you know, respected all over the world because of her music, which was a relation of both Arabic and Swahili. So that's one aspect I wanted to share with you and just to close by saying that even in religion, whereby we know that the people of the coast were more, is, were more were, were Islam, but at the same time, they had the same belief 
about God. And uh, there's this song I'm going to sing for you. This just shows the importance of religion in both the two cultures. And the song says, um, Mungu wakitaka kupa kulete ibarua Ukupa usingizini pasi mwenye we kujua Wena mbio sikupata bure unajisumbua Muhogo wa jagombe sija uramba muhiko Usitukane wakunga na uzazi ungaliko So in this song it's a smooth Arabic Arab music and it's saying that when God wants to bless you, you he doesn't need to write you a letter. Mm -hmm. He can bless you anyway in your sleep. Mm -hmm. And therefore, don't rush through life. Because mm -hmm. that doesn't mean you'll get your blessing. Your blessing will come anyway. And you can see this will relate more with both the people who come from the coast and also the Omani culture because they all believe they are supreme being. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So can we go now to Nathaniel and then Musna yeah, and we'll yeah, wrap it up yeah, with yeah, you, Dr. Yeah, okay. yeah, uh, myself. Um, I guess what I would say in closing is to bring the historical narrative that we've been trying to paint of the 19th century and bring it up into the 20th century to talk about identity. And one of the most important things that happens uh, is that there is a huge migration from up country, especially to Mombasa, mm. uh, of, of people coming from up country to the coast. And this is as a result of colonialism, as a result of the new job opportunities uh, at the port in Mombasa. And so the character of Mombasa actually changes drastically in the period of between 1890 and the 1930s and 40s. And uh, uh, Ali Mazrui's father, who is uh, uh, an Islamic reformer and intellectual is writing about these processes and he's saying, you know, we need to get it together, coastal people, because <laughs> the upcountry people are coming and they have <laughs> education and they're hungry for jobs and, you know, they're going to be taking over everything. Um, and that relates also to the process of creating nations in East Africa and also in Oman. One of the most salient points that has affected uh, Swahili identity in the 20th century is the growing importance of being a member of a nation. Now, this is something we take for granted. You mentioned passports, Professor Nair. <laughs> but in the period before European colonialism, these people were traveling with no, uh, no, no formal passport or maybe even many passports or different forms of citizenship and belonging. In the 20th century, especially leading up to the decolonization of Africa, it becomes absolutely so important for you to have a national identity and to have a national passport. So where do the Swahili fit into this paradigm? Well, in Kenya, as, uh, as some of you can attest to, they're viewed very ambivalently as maybe not so Kenyan as we really want them to be because they're all associated with this Arab business and overseas, which we have a an understanding that that's tainted by slavery and they didn't really participate in the in the protests against colonialism like we did and so there's a marginalization that happens of the coast which continues to this day to think of coastal people as not being really Kenyan or not being really African um, and that has everything to do with the politics of national identity so I think if we can think about things transnationally and to think of and just accept the Swahili people as they are and as they say they are, we can begin to delve uh, uh, much deeper into this issue. The same goes for Oman. On the Omani side, the process of nationalization happens a bit later, but it affects things in the same way because it forces people to uh, give up, surrender their Tanzanian or Kenyan passports to become an Omani citizen, and it, it, it almost forces them to think of themselves only in terms of their Omaniness, their Omani identity. And so these other aspects, these very complex aspects of identity, get put to the side in this process of nationalization. And that's something that we're still dealing with to this day in both Oman and Zanzibar. And I'd like to think that this mm -hmm. symposium and others is in some small, tiny way contributing mm -hmm. to maybe undoing some of that. <coughs> um, I would like to say thank you to Nicole, uh, to everybody in Smithsonian, uh, to invite me all over from Oman to here. 
Um, and you know, as an artist, uh, I can't speak like the other people. Uh, I, I normally do images, you know, mm -hmm. to express mm -hmm. myself. Mm -hmm. So I, I find it hard to talk too much or to just to express. Uh, but I, I think it's very important to to put uh, to underline uh, the relationship between Oman and Zanzibar uh, through art, because uh, I, I felt my country um, wasn't. Um, after the revolution that happened in the 60s, uh, people were not really wanted to talk about it, wanted to talk about Zanzibar and what happened because there was a lot of people killed and, and slaughtered, etc., etc. So I felt it was very important to, to, you know, to speak about it and also to make the world to understand that Oman was one day uh, in, in Zanzibar and the capital city was 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 not in Muscat actually, it was in Zanzibar. Mm -hmm. So that's what I wanted to say and thank you so much for coming and listening to us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No, I think in the interest of time, I will just pass and let the people talk. <laughs> he has turn it, turned it over to you all. So if there are a couple of questions that we might... Okay, I'll throw out the first one then. I can do it. I'm wondering what all this means in terms of our sense of global connectedness. We're talking about a fine little coast here, Swahili coast. But in this age of globalization, when nothing exists in a vacuum, how is this particular coast and the questions of identity and history that we've grappled with today connected <laughs> to our broader humanity? Our humanity as a... Um, as a global community. As a global community. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I, I guess you could say that the, the coast is um, in, in a more um, foreboding light uh, a microcosm of the, the potentialities and the dangers of living in a global community where there are a scarce amount of resources, where there, for, we were talking at lunch about what's going on in Lamu. Um, which, for those of you who don't know, there is plans to build a, a major port there, which will bring economic uh, advancement and, uh, and jobs and, and so on and so forth, and a lot of people will make a lot of money, um, but will also likely lead to a great deal of cultural and, and um, ecological devastation. So I think uh, in many ways the, the Swahili coast uh, uh, can serve as a, as a warning, like, we all need to learn how to work together as a global community. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because these conflicts over water, over land, over resources, if we don't find a just and equitable way to solve them, they're going to continue to manifest and reappear in violent acts, which we saw in, uh, in Kenya this summer, uh, if, if we don't find a sustainable way to deal with them, that will continue to happen. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's one lesson, perhaps a foreboding one. I think this is filmed, so your dissertation committee can just say, oh. Oh. <laughs> 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 Anyway, are there any other questions from the floor? Something. You're going to chime in? Okay. Okay. I wanted to say something about your question. I think uh, we're forgetting one thing, which is the Swahili language in itself. And the Swahili language is the most important, uh, 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 I could say, symbol of how when people come together from different cultures and they work together, what they can birth that is positive. Because um, the Swahili language, as you know, is a mixture of mostly the Bantu language and the Arabic language. And with this, Swahili not, is now the national language of Kenya, of Tanzania, it is spoken in uh, parts of Rwanda, Burkina Faso, Congo, um, uh, Uganda, and many other countries of East Africa, and even now, mm. if I may say, Central okay. Africa. So I would say that they, there is really meaning and a value, and there is growth when people come together and do things together for not as an indifference, but trying to help one another because. I mean, I'm here in the United States, and I can tell you, as a performer myself, I teach people Swahili who are going to work in Kenya and Tanzania and other parts of East Africa. So that's the beauty 
of coming together that we were able to have this wonderful language which is Swahili and it's also very romantic, if I may say. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, there's a piece, and I can't resist saying this, but, you know, I'm, um, I guess I'm of the hip-hop generation, but my parents, you know, they would play Lionel Richie. <laughs> and he was, you yes. know, evoking this kind of he Swahili some cultural Swahili identity. Words in his song, yeah. And so for many of us who really, you know, in my immediate background, we didn't have that sense of understanding that we have uh -huh. about all the diverse identities that make up Africa. Yes. That song, that early introduction into Swahili, we yeah. were walking around singing these songs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And it be, but it became a part of who we are. So, so I, I appreciate yeah. reminding me uh -huh. of that moment. And there are many other songs that <laughs> Americans have sung and have said a few words in Swahili. <laughs> Even Michael Jackson says some words. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. yeah, cause, cause somebody had that question. I'm sorry. We're dancing and singing up now. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I had a quick question. So I'm from um, Kenya, oh. and uh, I am Swahili with oh. Amani heritage. Mm. Um, I am, however, curious. Obviously, Amani, Oman had a great influence on East Africa, and not just on Swahili culture, but from my understanding, also on Somali culture. For example, my grandmother was, a, I think, the granddaughter of the Sultan of Mogadishu who is related to the Sultan of Oman, but I haven't really seen anything in terms of that relationship, like Oman and Somalia. A lot of it tends to be, the focus tends to be on Zanzibar, mm -hmm. and to some extent Mombasa and Kenya and Lamu. But I was wondering if any of you know, uh, yeah. knew of any information mm -hmm. regarding that. Let him do it. He's a great yes. <laughs> 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 Let him go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, so in my research uh, in Muscat, I actually talked to uh, the family of uh, what was, I guess they would be the great-grandsons of the former Wali of Mogadishu, who was the Sultan's representative there. Um, in terms of the relationship of the influence of Omanis on Somali culture, I know a lot less, but I do know that Mogadishu is an important part of this conversation and, there, and that there was a, an Omani governor actually in the town uh, for, for a long time. Um, I don't know if folks want to add something onto that. Yeah, I think what I would say to you is, again, you do have a relationship between the Somalis and the Arabs. This goes back to the first Migration. The, the Somalis and the Swahili speakers are affected differently. Most of the linguists who study the languages from North Africa all the way down to Dar es Salaam, we make a distinction between the Afro Semitic, you have the Amhara and the Tigrinya, and so on other groups that are in Ethiopia. If you have any doubt about that, go to Yemen. And you will find a lot of Somalis in Yemen. There are a lot of Somalis. Of course, you know the Somalis, they used to have seven kingdoms. Mm -hmm. Very much linked to the Arabs and particularly to the Omani people. Someone in an earlier conversation talked about the changing dynasties and how one dynasty, which is the ruling dynasty now, this, <laughs> captured the control. And here you have to bring into the equation political rivalry in the Arab history. During the collapse of the Umayyad dynasty, many of those people who were overthrown, they fled to East Africa. That's part of the Arab history. So you have the Arab refugees who came to East Africa. That's one of the reasons why when she was talking about slavery, you see, the Arabs, they have some very interesting concepts if you come to Islam and you look at the history of marriages, there were four kinds of marriages among the Arabs before Islam exercised control over marriages. Like the Christians and the Jews, monogamy is now celebrated. Polygamy, which is known in free Christian Judaism, Solomon, you know what he says. Then the Arabs, they have a concept called Musa. The only people who practice Musa is like the hippies. <laughs> we don't talk about that in polite society in America. Musa, temporary marriage. 
with the woman. Islam came, it got rid of certain things which was in Arab society. And that was, the French have the concept of the courtesan. The Americans call them call girls. This kind of situation existed. Now, when they came to East Africa, when she was telling you about how those girls could be adopted, the women could be adopted just like the men who may be brought into the community. That's why they have the concept of the people who are the equivalent of what Americans call the green card holder. Moalis. The Moalis. You are not Arab, but we can bring you into the community. You learn Arabic, and we think you are part of the tribe. Mm. Yeah, can I say something? Go ahead now, that's where I want to get you. Uh, <laughs> actually, they created something called the Mawali. Uh, uh, Mawali, Mawali in Arabic means like, um, uh, it's from the word Wali. Wali means a governor. So you're part of our tribe, but you're not really. Uh, None of us. And it was in the tribes of Saudi Arabia, some were Shimmer, Matairi, and so the elite tribes in Arabia always were, um, had Mawalis who served for them, who helped them, who worked, uh, who, who did also the, the, the wars and the Ghazwas. So they were basically called Mawali, not to make them feel they are out of the tribe mm -hmm. and also to be very loyal. To the, to, the, to the tribe itself. No, thank you very much. That's a good footnote for the discussion. The last point I wanted to make with regard to the question about the Somalis. Mm -hmm. The Somalis, most linguists, they will call them the Kusites. Mm -hmm. They are not, of the, they are Kusites. They are not Afro-Semitic. That's why the Israelis, when they were having a lot of opposition from the blacks in Africa and the African Americans, they came with Operation Moses, Operation Solomon, Operation Siba. And that's why if you go to Jerusalem today or in Israel, you have thousands of Ethiopian Jews. Mm -hmm. That's the narrative we are talking about here. How people define themselves, their identity, how they define relationships. The Somalis, you go to Saudi Arabia, because most of the Livestock used by the Saudis during the Hajj came from Ethiopia and Somalia. Mm -hmm. That was why, as a young diplomat in Saudi Arabia in 1975-78, they have, she knows Arabic, they have Somali, small Somali. Mm -hmm. You have Somalia Kabir, Somalia Sahir, little Somalia. They used to have little Somalia in Jeddah. So that's the story she's talking about. Because you see, if you come to the Arabs, just like Americans, you are not American, you are from Hungary. Mm -hmm. We give you green card. You are Latino, we can make you American. We give you green card. After a while, you become American. <laughs> that's what they used to do. <laughs> so let me just check with Glenn. Am I good on time? Can I take no, some I more know. questions? Thanks. Somebody. I think there's another question. Yeah, the Hello. There Hi. Um, thank you all for sharing. Um, I actually wanted to offer something, it's not a question. Um, as an academic as well in African diaspora studies um, and on the topic of identity, I wanted to offer that we continue to push ourselves to give those who were who enslaved their identity, their agency, their humanity by not using the term slaves, mm -hmm. masters, right? Um, slavery was a condition. It wasn't your identity. It, did, it wasn't who you were. You weren't slave one, slave two. Yes. You had a name. You had a mother, right? You had a lineage. And so I think it's really important in these spaces to, to be conscious of the terminology that we're using, the language that we're using, mm -hmm. um, to really pay respects to our ancestors who went through that experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Another question from the floor? Yeah. Oh, a couple. Yeah. I could probably just do this without my there you go. I won't be long. Okay. I was just going to add to the identity crisis that's developing. 
we lived, my husband and I lived in the Middle East for seven years, um, back from 95 to 2001, and flew back to America on September 10th, 2001, after living in the Middle East for seven years. But this growing thing about, there's so many workers in Saudi Arabia, in the United Arab Emirates, who've come from these countries, Pakistan, mm -hmm. uh, wherever they've come from, and they've been, that's all they know. Yeah. That's all they've known. And there was discussion after discussion where, while we were there about what are we going to do with these people who consider themselves part of Abu Dhabi or the Emirates or Saudi Arabia. And we're not having that, the, the Saudis and some of the Emirates because they're saying these people are not in writings, but these kids don't know where they, they don't know where they belong. So I think that might be a discussion that we'll hear more of that because it's still, it's still happening and more and more we know that people from these other countries are going over to do the work. And as soon as some of the folk from these countries can afford to bring their families, they're bringing them there mm -hmm. and that's all they know. We could talk more about that. There's plenty going on over there. But. Mm -hmm. well, I did want to just add to that. I think that's an extremely important question to be thinking about, certainly not just in terms of the Indian Ocean, but in terms of the entire building up of Abu Dhabi and Doha and that entire, the, on the, and the Emirates. Because Pakistani, Bangladeshi workers in projects such as uh, MU Abu Dhabi and various other projects are being profoundly um, exploited. So I think one of the ways mm -hmm. into this kind of discussion is about labor relations. Yes. It's about questions of um, international movement of capital, this pro really explosion of neoliberal um, um, ideologies that are supporting the kinds of massive capitalist sure. projects that are not, are, you know, really re-enslaving, mm -hmm. excuse me for the term, but now we're talking about it as like an economic, an economic, you know, reality indeed, yeah. Um, and, but your point is really, really well taken, and I wanted to speak to that as well. Um, I think this is something that we really do have to think very, very seriously about, and I, I think as an academic Absolutely. and uh, sure. artistic uh, community as well, uh, because um, it's, it's going to only accelerate, I think, mm -hmm. and so I, I really appreciate your raising that comment and mm -hmm. to be thinking, I think we all have to be mindful of, of uh, bringing our analyses and treatments to this question of, of the, the, the now, the, the different international flow of labor, but yet on a, on a very different level in terms of it's the massive exploitation and the accountability. Is there accountability mm -hmm. for NYU and for the Emirates? Uh, there must be, but what, what are the structures in place? And if not, then why? Why aren't they? Mm -hmm. um, I think so just to open, I, so I appreciate the, the uh, comment. Can I comment on that? Sure. Yes. I, I wanted to make just one point, Beverly, because you know what comes to mind immediately uh, for me are the many Indonesian uh, domestic workers in Saudi Arabia who are in some cases partnering with young Saudis, and then you have the offspring, the children, who are very much grappling with, well, who am I? Really. So your point is very well taken, and I have to share. It's one that didn't immediately come to mind mm -hmm. when I thought of this conversation, but I thank you for inviting me to attach it to this conversation. And just in a, and to follow on what you were just saying, too, I mean, these people don't even have the luxury to say, who am I? It's not for them at the exactly. beginning, it's about who am I. It's like, can I survive this? Mm -hmm. exactly. mm -hmm. And if not, how can, I, how can I extricate from this? And I can't, because usually they are indebted. Anyway, it's another conversation, see, but I think it's a really important. See, I think you're right, and I think it hits on our colleague's point about this language that we are using to define those who are, aren't, who yeah. are just trying to, to survive. It. But let's go to Absolutely. Muna. Yes. Thanks a lot. Um, I think uh, coming from the Gulf, uh, as you live and you see uh, all these workers every day, it, it tears your heart. Uh, but I think uh, Oman had a different uh, direction comparing with the other Gulf countries. Like, because Oman was, uh, sorry, uh, Emirates was built by traders. Uh, very adventurous traders, Sheikh Zayed and all, all the sheikhs. So they didn't really, they were impatient to, 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 you know, they wanted to build the country fast, they wanted to make uh, a business hub. And I think they succeeded in that very well. I mean, uh, Dubai is, 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 you know, uh, go, moving fast and very, uh, everything is just uh, on progress. But uh, they just didn't pay attention to the people. 
to their own people, to the Emiratis, to the, to the people who were living in the center of Dubai before the 70s, who had houses, who had, they destroyed them mm -hmm. and made skyscrapers. Mm -hmm. And I think it was really unfair. And I still think it's unfair to, to the people when you see people in Abu Dhabi, I mean, they are educated there. But they were taken from their own homes and they, many things were destroyed. I mean, they are now, uh, because the system is very capitalistic, and I think Oman was taken more like a social system, but it's still uh, the the slavery or the labor is still going on. Um, but I, I hope it changes in, in in a way when people could take over and uh, change things like that, because uh, the existence of these uh, labors in this society, developing society, is not really good. You know, because the system is still. Uh, not yet understood by the citizens. So what about the, mm -hmm. you know, there's uncertainty. Yeah, yeah, quickly, you know, in the interest of time, what I would say is, I hope that the museum will be sufficiently motivated by all of us here mm -hmm. to really continue this dialogue mm -hmm. and get other people who have different experiences to come and share this narrative. I would like to see people like Nathaniel who are researching this for to be present at least to see what is going on. Because you see, when we talk about this issue, mm. labor relations are very key in the West over the last 140 years. Mm -hmm. This is why Americans and the other Western countries work very hard to solve the labor problem. It was an uphill battle, you know, in this country before they have labor movements in this country. And the labor groups are really dying in America mm -hmm. society yes. because the capitalism has changed the relationships. You see, so if you go to the Middle East, they haven't even traveled the way of the West yet with regard to labor relations. You have the ILO, International Labor Organization, which is very concerned about this. In America here, people are concerned about minimum wages. Mm -hmm. Do you have minimum wages over there? Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. You see, then I just big issues that must be raised. Mm -hmm. So most of these liberal concepts, we all take for granted. We run around it. You ask, are they alive? A liberal concept alive in some of those countries? Some will say no. But you see, if you begin to ask this whole question of relationships, there are American groups I have been involved with, free the slaves. It's an American NGO. It's I here. There are many groups like that that are trying to address the issue she is raising. Mm -hmm. Free the Slaves is an organization, is an American NGO. They were trying to push what we are talking about. What happened to these people you're talking about? You go to, the problem is this, let me be honest with you. I'm just speaking as a former diplomat and somebody who can talk to you now, I'm mm -hmm. going to in that capacity. I am not going to be as discreet and quiet. But what I can tell you is that the elites of this country sending the immigrants mm -hmm. benefit from that. Filipinos are now characteristically known around the world as the homeland of nurses. Mm. You go to most parts of the world, you find the girls who are nurses who are not indigenous, they are Filipino girls. In the Middle East, who are the nurses in those hospitals? In Oman oh, you're going to find many Filipinos. Mm. So if you find these Filipinos, some of these Filipinos were making money from this. Mm -hmm. They have offices that train these young people to go and work as nurses in the Middle East. And you have sexual abuse cases. You see, we're not being diplomatic about it. These are cases that you can go. If you have any reason about this, go to Google, put Filipino nurses, slash, Middle East, and you will get all these stories. They'll come out. You see, what I'm trying to tell the audience here is that we are human beings. We talk about globalism, how we can live together as human beings. What we want for us in America, we must want for other people elsewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. We're not imposing it on them, but we are just telling them we struggle so hard to get to this level here. If you can fight for it and we help you, fight for it. I'll leave it like that. Absolutely. If you all would just join me and just really giving a big, huge thank you to each of our panelists. I should say that this is, in really ways, the beginning of an ongoing 
conversation. Allison will have a wonderful exhibition up at Cranert on this topic. Anna, who is gifted in all ways, is constantly producing, so you'll just have to follow all of her wonderful work. Dr. And Yang has a whole list of wonderful scholarship that can be followed. Muzna, our film director, is constantly releasing film. And Nathaniel, well, he's just about to put out a dissertation and then a book and more and you're more my, and you're more. You're my new dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> On this, and then from the vantage point of the museum, I can tell you, that we have just in a couple of weeks on December 3rd and 4th an opera that I hope you will join us at, uh, that you will, jo uh, that you will um, uh, come to attend. We will also have in the spring a, uh, a conversation with Abdul Razak Gurna and Gugiwa Tiongo mm -hmm. and MG Vasanji. Uh, and we will have more and more and more under this project. I could go on and on and on. It is spearheaded by my colleague who's just in the back there, mm -hmm. Nicole, mm -hmm. who's Nicole. talking, mm -hmm. Nicole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> that one. And then our other colleague here, Glenn, uh, who is just, <laughs> my goodness, all things to all people. Mm -hmm. So if we could just give all of us a big round of applause. Oh, that's going to wrap it up for us. No, I'm not wrapping it up, but I just want to say uh, it's a shameful plug, but I put it out anyway. Uh, my CD is uh, at the Smithsonian Museum store downstairs, so if you're interested in seeing my CDs, DVDs, or purchasing while they're at the Smithsonian store, thank you very much. Well, can you take us out in song? Yes. Oh, 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 wow. Oh. All right, so uh, uh, it's always good if we sing together, right? Okay, all right. So, uh, you know, everybody know Jumbo, Jumbo Buana? Jumbo. Uh, Jumbo. Jumbo, yes, Big Kumari Ghani. So I'm teaching you some Swahili. So when, when, uh, uh, when Lion King, what they say Lion King? Akura Matata? Yeah, that is Swahili, okay? So it means there's no worries. So now, Akura uh, Matata. <laughs> So, can we sing Akuda Matata? No, I don't know. I know Jambo Buana more. Oh, you want Jambo Buana? Okay. So, you can all sing together. Want to go? Okay. Jambo, Jambo Buana, Habari Gani, Sumi Sana, Wageni, Watari Vishwa, Hata Kwetu, Akuda Matata. Jambo, so Jambo means hi. We show you are all welcome. Kenya Yetu, Hakuna Matata, and Hakuna Matata means no worries. Thank you very much. Thank you.